Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to work through the group question. So I'm going to read the entire scenario, and then we're going to answer the, um, we will answer, what we're going to answer, we will answer the um, statement of changes in equity question. The focus mainly for me is going to be on how to set up a statement of changes in equity and how to, how to get the answer. We, um, we will see if we can actually get the actual answer, but I, I want to focus on how to get the answer. Why that's important? Because um, if you know how to get to an answer, then you should be able to get to this answer and any other answer that is required when you do a different state of change in equity question. So that is more a focus of me to prepare you to handle any question that comes your way. Also, <laughs> While we may not get to the actual answer of this, because there's quite a bit of um, transactions happening. So there's going to be like, um, I saw there's like, uh, what was it now? Um, the benches and all of those type of things. So we're going to read through everything. As we read through, we're going to try to, um, we're going to try and, um, how can I say, um, understand each point and make notes. And I'll give you some important things that we need to identify as we read through. Then we're going to work through how to set up a statement of changes in equity and how to get the numbers. Um, if there's still time left, I doubt it, but if there will still be time left, then we'll do the actual answer. But for me, that is going to be a perfect um, um, situation where you must then go and try and get the answer. And then any where you struggle, you contact me and we have a one-to-one -one or if there's, if, there's a, if there's more than one person getting struggling with the same issue, then we have a, I'll, I'll, um, I'll do a quick group call or something of that nature. Remember the one-to-ones is like 10, 15 minute sessions, where you can book time with me. So um, so I, for me, like um, the CTA guys just wrote now, they are they, they kind of, they, they just finished a, a week or so ago and they were saying how different the questions were. So that is why if you practice only to answer this particular question, you're gonna, you will struggle in the actual exam. So remember the training is more about how do you get to, a, to an answer in principle because, uh, so that you can replicate it in another example. There will be a few differences in terms of, um, they're not gonna be exactly replicable, but because you have, you know what the end destination should look like you will be able to navigate given the scenario how to get there. So remember, um, uh, for, for um, let's say you need to, I don't know where, where um, like for example, your campus CAA, right? Let's say it's a physical place that you need to go to. Um, all of you need to get to the same place. How you get there will differ depending on where you're coming from. Okay. But ultimately, you will all end up at the same place. And that is why, and there's the same uh, analogy over here, you need to know where you, where you are, where you need to end up. Now, given where your starting point is, how you get there will differ. Okay. Um, so it's the same thing over here. So I want to show you where you need to end up at. What is what you're trying to achieve? Where you're trying to land? What is your destination? How you get to the destination all depends on where you are. And where you are is going to do with what the scenario is giving you. And um, so make sure you, you, you know where you need to end up at. And obviously, there's going to be a few different pathways, but there are principles that we will apply for the different pathways. Same thing, there'll be different modes of transport you will have to make use of. So for example, some of you can walk. Some of you will, can drive, will need to drive. How you drive? Well, either take your own car or you will take a bus or you take a taxi or you take a train, whatever it is. Okay, so there's different modes of transport all depending on where you are. So um, it's the same thing over here. How you get there will differ depending on um, what scenario you're given. So just remember those type of things you need to think about. And that is why when you work through a question, it's important to focus on the question 
but it's equally important to sit back and then think about what did you learn? What were the principles being tested? Because the same principle may be tested in the next exam, but how they test it will be different. How they present the information will be different. So don't just run through question papers. Going through three, four, five is important, but uh, make sure that if you're doing six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 question papers, that you are not foregoing the quality, that you're not foregoing thinking through what you are learning. If you can't explain to yourself in the mirror or while you're laying in bed um, what you have just learned, what were the principles tested, then you need to rather not move on to a next question and re-look at the, at, the, at the question you just did. Not redo it, re-look at it and try to figure out what was tested, um, do I actually know what I need to do, um, how to get to the answer, the principles that, 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 that needs to be applied? Those are the type of things you want to work through because you are actively asking the relevant questions. Your brain will start making the necessary connections. But when you're just running through, your brain is just not really making any connection. It's just kind of answering what is there, but you, you haven't taken the time to let your brain absorb what it actually learned. And that is why the reflection process is so important because you're giving the time for your brain to actually absorb what it actually learned. It is something similar in, in, um, in when you do fitness, when you gym. Um, one of the, um, the actual work happens when you are resting then the muscles do what it needs to do. You have to obviously do the actual gymming for the muscles to work, but the muscles uh, um, start really working in the recovery period. So it's the same thing. Your brain is going to start to absorb once you sit back and reflect, as opposed to just running through more questions. Okay. So please make sure um, that you study on a more deeper level and don't worry about running through a million questions. I'm not saying one question. One question is too little. Three questions is the bare minimum. But ID, so like for me, you should be able to get to about five questions, three to five, okay? And, um, and make sure you're learning thoroughly. Um, obviously, everything that doesn't need to be at, at, um, at three questions, you want to probably do three questions for the topics that are big and the topics that you are struggling with. So for example, revenue is a big topic. But if you're comfortable with revenue, then three question papers is fine. But if you're struggling with revenue, then you probably want to do five. And remember, if you're still struggling after five, then it's more questions is not going to help you. Fundamentally, you need to sort out what's then fundamentally something is wrong. You need to understand the theory and make sure you understand the, the how to apply the theory because doing more questions is not going to make a difference. So just be uh, um, so just be um, just be aware of that. Okay. Now, um, so I'm going to um, switch over now and we're going to read through the scenario. We're going to set up the. Um, we're going to set up the statement of changes in equity, and we're going to um, we're going to um, what we're going to do now, and, and we're going to show you how to get to the numbers. Right? We may not get to the actual number, but then that's going to be your homework, and then we can see whether you can get to the actual number. And your homework is going to be if we don't get to the actual numbers, your homework is going to be to get to the actual numbers, and then compare it to the solution and try to figure out. Um, whether you got the stuff right or whether, you, or whether you got the stuff not right. And for the stuff that you never got right, if you can figure out how to get to the right number. And if you still can't, then you set up a time with me so we can explain um, how to get to that number. You will never, ever, ever believe how much you will learn when you mark yourself and you try to figure out why your answer is different to the solution. You, it will, once you figure out why your answer is different to the solution and you understand why the solution got to that answer that they're looking for, you, um, there will be so many connections happening in your brain. So that is why uh, um, it's, uh, make sure that part of your learning, your study process is to mark yourself and review, compare your answer with the solution and see where you differ a lot of um, learning happens in that process. Because like I said, you are actively trying to figure out why your answer is like that and why the solution is like that. And then you'll be able to rectify what you got wrong and um, make sure you get it right going forward. So don't underestimate that process, okay? 
So let's just put, I'm going to share now my screen again, and then we're going to read through the scenario. We're going to answer the, the required. Before I move on, any questions from your side? No questions from me. Okay. Thank you. So we can go. Let's go on. Okay. So they say, um, so generous group limited SG is a bath and tub Zimbabwe retailer that was incorporated in 2015. SG is listed on the Johannesburg, uh, SG is listed on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange and operates from its head office in the Sunshine City, Harare. Okay. So we can just see nothing really um, important in that first three lines. There was a sharp decrease in the demand of baths and tubs in Harare, and, it, and SG turned to other cities where the demand was on the rise as they had a lot of residential construction taking place. This resulted in SG establishing bath and tub retail business in Pula, Pulawayo. The year end for all companies within the SG group is 30 June, SG's functional currency and presentation currency is the Zimbabwean dollar. Below is SG's equity items as at the given dates. Okay, so before we go on, so here you might just be able to be aware that there they said there was a sharp decrease over here. Um, so here they said there's a, here's a sharp decrease in Harare, right? What you must know that um, in another question, this could be an indicator of impairment. Okay, so it may not be here. So all it deals with impairment in, in groups, but there could be an indicator of impairment um, in another question. Okay, so that is an, an indicator of impairment. Okay, the other important aspect is that the year ends is 30th June 2020, 30th June. Okay, so the, um, the equity balances for SG, so 1 July 2019 and 30th um, June 2020. So obviously the first column is opening balance and the last column is closing balance. Okay, so here we have um, share capital, we have um, retained earnings, we have net profit after tax, and then they're saying the profit excludes the matters stated below. So as you can see, we will have to work out, we have to make adjustments to this profit number because there's some numbers we have to take into account. Okay, so that is SG. So they say on 1 October 2017, SG acquired 80% of the shares and voting rights of MS for an amount of $10 million. From this date, SG had control of MS in terms of I for S10. MS is incorporated in Zimbabwe. MS functional and presentation currency is the Zimbabwean dollar. Okay, so now we know from 1 October 2017, um, we had to, what did we have to do? We have to consolidate. Why do we have to consolidate? Because we have a subsidiary. Okay, how do we know we have a subsidiary? Because we have control. So they say the following equity is in the records of MS at the respective dates. So here you can see 1 October 2017. This is the date of acquisition. Then we have 1 October, 1 July 2018. We have 1 July 2019, and then we have 30th June 2020. Okay, so share capital remained the same. Retain earnings changed over the years. And then we have mark to market reserve that changed over the years. Okay. Okay, so they say all the assets and liabilities of MS were fairly valued at the acquisition date with the exception of trade payables that were erroneously recorded at 890 uh, more than the carrying amount and machinery was overvalued by 780. 
the machinery had a remaining useful life of six years at the acquisition date. On 2nd January 2020, SG sold a hundred hot tubs um, for okay for dollars to MS. The transaction was at a profit of 20%. 60% of the inventory was still on hand on 30th June, 2020. Okay, so here's a few things I need to take note. Um, that there, there are two adjustments, two adjustments at acquisition, and then there is an intercompany transaction. Okay, so there are two adjustments at acquisition and an intercompany transaction. So we'll have to adjust. So the intercompany transaction will impact um, the current year's profits and then the machinery would obviously, um, the um, depreciation will be impacted by the adjustment on machinery. Okay, so they say the fair value of the shares of MS amounted to the following at the respective date. So they give you the amount. MS declared a dividend of 550,000 on 30th June, 2020. So once again, because MS declared a dividend, um, I can't remember. I think we um, SG has an eighty percent interest. I can't remember. I think I read eighty percent. So that means in SG's profit is a dividend income of eighty percent of this amount. Okay, so we'll have to remove that because that is an intercompany transaction. Okay, so they're gonna. So whatever this is. Pre Presidium security vehicle. So on 1 June 2020, SG decided to venture into security service business. Okay, very different to hot tubs, but okay. This was necess necessitated by the increase in theft cases caused by COVID-19 challenges faced by the general populace, whatever that is. SG identified two parties in the security in industry to partner with namely Forsat and Sieveguard. During the year, three parties, during the, during the year, three parties entered into, I'm assuming the three parties entered into a contractual arrangement to work together for the purpose of fulfilling a contract for the security of the president of Malawi, who will be coming to Zimbabwe to strengthen trade relations. The negotiation provided SG with 50% on the voting rights in the arrangement, um, force with 30% and sieve with 20%. The contractual arrangement between the three parties specifies that at least 75% of the voting rights are required to make decisions um, about the relevant activities of the arrangement. Okay. The parties set up a separate vehicle uh, called um, Presidium Security through which to conduct the arrangement. The vehicle, Presidium Security, will enter into the contract on behalf of the three parties. The assets and liabilities relating to the arrangement are held in Presidium Security. The main feature of the contractual arrangement between the parties is that it transfers the rights, um, the rights to the assets and obligations for the liabilities to the parties. Okay, so this is a, this is a joint arrangement. So when you have a joint arrangement and the rights, the assets and liabilities are the responsibilities of the rights to the assets and the obligations to the to the um, obligations for the liabilities are with the actual underlying investors. Then it will then it more likely it is most likely a um, what do we call it now? It is most likely a um, a joint um, operation. Okay, if the rights and obligations are with are not with the parties, but rather with the with the entity itself, then it is more likely a joint venture. Okay, so just be aware of that. Okay, so the chief financial officer of SG, a chartered accountant in Zimbabwe concluded that the transaction on the joint venture in the security has no financial reporting implications and he did not disclose the transaction in SG's financial statements. Okay, that's incorrect. Additionally, um, he did not disclose this to the auditors during inquiries 
about any significant changes that occur since the last audit. The CFO's reason was that, was that why should he bother himself about the transaction that has no financial reporting implications and that the auditors are not aware of? Okay, so obviously that's incorrect. It is firstly a major transaction, um, so they must be aware of it. And um, secondly, it is that does have financial implications. Whether it is a joint venture or a joint operation, there will be a um, there will be implications. I presume they're probably going to ask you to discuss what type of an arrangement is it. So you're probably going to have to conclude that it is a joint um, that it is a joint um, arrangement. Once you conclude that it is a joint arrangement, then you'll have to discuss whether it is a joint operation or whether it is a joint venture. Okay, so, um, and then once you know whether it's a joint operation or a joint venture, you will have to discuss um, how to treat each one. But ultimately, the, it does have financial implications for SG. Okay, now we have other investments. So SG's strategy is to see the group growing and as a result, SG diversified into various types of investments. You have been recently appointed the accountant for SG and below are the transactions that SG entered into, which require your input on how they should be accounted for in the financial statements. Okay, so now remember, ultimately, we um, dealing with a group question and I'm telling you that the uh, half of the required, half of the hundred marks is for um, is for the statement of changes in equity. And obviously, because the profit number is not complete, we're gonna have to work, identify all the profit, um, all the profit and loss implications for the for the financial year ended 30th June 2020. So each of these will have a profit and loss implication. How, when you read through this, you want to try to identify the profit or loss implication, but how you also want to identify it, how you want to think also, what helps you to think and identify various types of implications is to think in terms of journal entries. Okay, so when you see a transaction, try to ask yourself, what is the journal entry? Remember, the debits and the credits must balance. So the journal entry must balance. Um, so if you can identify, if you can process the journal entry in your head, then that will help you to identify what implications um, needs to take place. So when you read, especially in a financial reporting question, because remember, when it comes to financial reporting, what are the type of questions that you need to be able to answer? So typically, you're going to have to prepare financial statements. Now remember, financial statements could either be all the financial statements or or some of the financial statements. So the type of financial statement that, that we have is the profit or loss, the, in, um, the, the balance sheet, the equity statement, the cash flow statement, the notes of the financial statements, okay? So you must be able to prepare financial statements. You must be able to discuss a question. That's number two. Number three, you must be able to do calculations. Number four, you must be able to, pre, uh, to, to process journal entries. Now, if you can process journal entries, that will solve the problem of um, the, the issue of journal entries. It will also help you to identify which statements are impacted, okay? Um, so if you can process in your, in your head the journal entry, then you will be able to answer a journal entry question. You'll be able to answer um, a financial statements question, and ultimately you'll be able to do a calculation because remember, a journal entry requires a number. So the, you're not going to know if the journal entry is balanced or not if you don't have a number. So, um, so make sure you can do that. So in order to get the number, you must be able to perform a calculation. And then a discussion, obviously that's different. You will have to see whether you can discuss a, um, a, a particular item. So just make sure. So when we read through this, we will try to see if we can process the journal entries as we read it. Okay. Um, so they say the property investment. Okay, so on 2nd January, um, on 2nd January 2020, SG bought a small office space in Borrowdale for 14 
no, for $140,000 with the intention of leasing the office space to earn rentals. The purchase price was paid on 1 May 2020, when control of the office space and the legal title passed to SG. On 1 May 2020, SG advertised the office space through some property agents in Borrowdale. Um, in Borrowdale, however, the office space remained unoccupied on 30th June 2020. SG also incurred legal costs of 5,000 to transfer the office space from the seller. SG also paid 15,000 rand to the lawyers who drafted the property acquisition agreement. The seller agreed to reimburse SG 25% of the property acquisition agreement costs. Furthermore, SG incurred stamp duty of $18,000 as part of the finance team's assessment of return on individual assets, it seemed SG was operating the office space at a loss to the tune of $500 up to 30th June, 2020. Okay, I don't know what that means. As part of the finance team's um, assessment of return on, on individual assets, it seems SG was operating the office space at a loss, whatever that means. Okay, so let's just have a look what happened over here. So we have a property investment, okay? We acquired it in the 2020 financial year. Um, con um, control only passed on 1 May 2020. So on 1 May 2020, we would be saying debit asset, credit bank or credit um, a payable. Okay, so it's a debit asset, credit bank or credit payable. Okay, one of the two, because we have to pay for it. So either we're paying it on terms or we're paying it on cash. Now the question is, so we know it's on 1 May. So the two questions remain. Number one, which asset is it? And then number two, at what amount do we recognize it? So we know it is debit asset, credit bank or payable, but the question is which asset and, um, and what amount. Now, which asset, the best way to do this is to always um, identify the various asset statements available, the, the various asset accounting standards available. Now, remember, we have inventory IAS2, we have PPE IAS16, we have um, we have um, intangible assets, IAS 38. We have investment property, IAS 40. We have, um, and then we have financial assets, IFRS 9, right? Then we could also have um, a leased asset, IFRS 16. Okay, so those are the various asset statements, the big asset statements. Inventory, IAS 2, um, PPE, um, IAS 16, intangible assets, IAS 38, investment property, IAS 40, um, what did I say was the other one? Uh, financial assets, IFRS 9, and then we could also have a leased asset, IFRS 16. So those are the, the, the six applicable standards, right? The various standards that deals with um, recognizing an asset. So we know on 1 May, we're saying debit asset, credit bank or credit payable. So now the question is, which asset? We know now the various asset statements in our head. Now we need to ask ourselves, which one does, which one, um, which uh, definition does this asset meet? So what should pop out in your head is that it's IAS 40, investment property. Why? Your intention is to um, earn rental income. So when you have a property, so a property is a fixed structure, land and buildings, with the intention of earning rental income, that meets the definition of IS 40. Okay, so now we know it's going to say debit investment property, not just in the, not, not asset now, debit investment property, credit, um, bank or payable. So what do you see over here? When you struggle with a, a journal entry, when you struggle with a scenario, try to process the journal entry, okay? Once you, um, when you wanna process a journal entry, first determine 
um, the elements of accounting. First, determine the elements of accounting. When I refer to the elements of accounting, I'm talking about the conceptual framework, which is whether it is an asset, a liability, equity, income, or an expense, okay? So first identify that, whether it's an asset, a liability, um, equity, income, or an expense. Once you have that, now you try and figure out, once you now know it is an asset, now you try to find out which asset and how to, to help yourself with that, just identify the various asset standards that we covered. So basically we covered almost every asset standard in the accounting, in the accounting standards. So you just run through the, the, the six typical ones and then you see which definition does it meet. So that's how you kind of eliminate and come to that point. Okay, so now we know we have debit investment, credit bank, or credit liability. Because remember when you buy something, you can either buy it for cash or you buy it on credit. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, so now the next part is at what amount? So where's the amount? So we are now again. Okay, so we know we bought it for $140,000. Okay, so that's the, 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 the cost of the property. But now there were other costs also incurred. Now remember, the cost of an asset is all costs incurred to bring the asset to a place and condition ready to be used as management intends. So it is a cost incurred to bring the asset to a place and condition ready to be used. So we know without, without the 140, we can't get the, without the 140, we can't get the property. So that's obviously by, by default, that's gonna be a cost incurred. Um, now they're saying, okay, is she also incurred a legal cost of 5,000 to transfer the office space from the seller? So we're gonna include $5,000, that's a cost. And then is she also paid, also paid 15,000 to the lawyers who drafted the property acquisition agreement? Okay, so we will also, without the property acquisition agreement, we won't, um, we won't get the property, so it's a cost incurred. Okay, so we can add the five, the 15,000. So, so far we have 140, 5,000 and 15,000. But they're saying here, the seller agreed to reimburse 25% of the property acquisition agreement. So where's the property acquisition agreement? Okay, so 25% of this, is so we only our cost is only 75 percent so there's one of two ways of doing it add the full 15,000 and then subtract um 25 percent of the 15,000 or you just include 75 percent of the 15,000 because remember we only incur costs that we can that, that we're actually going to incur we can't so for example if we're paying that then you won't include VAT because VAT you can claim back if you're a VAT vendor. So whatever you're not actually incurring, that you cannot include because it's not, because it's not a cost incurred. Okay, so therefore it's 140, 5,000, and then 75% um, of this 15,000. Okay, and then stamp duty of 18,000. Okay, so stem duty of 18,000. So therefore, the cost is going to be debit, um, debit investment of 140 plus five, plus 75% of 15,000 plus 18,000. Okay, then they say we made a loss of 500 rands. I'm assuming that is the, um, the fair value loss on the um, year to date. So this fair value loss would be debit, fair value loss, PNL, credit investment property. So that 500,000, I mean, that $500 will be in a profit or loss line item that must impact our profit number. Okay. Is there any questions at this point on that issue? Yes, uh, I have a question. Um, okay. Just, just a quick one. Yes. Um, when they say the office space was operating at a loss of five hundred, yeah. what exactly will be happening? Yeah. So what I am, what I can, 
only thing I can assume is the following, okay? Um, the only thing I can assume is that with the way that it reads, it's, it says the return on the assets was operating at the office space at the loss of 500. So what I, if I think of accounting, well, we, we will confirm when we read when we read the um, we I will confirm I will confirm when we read the additional information to see the the accounting treatment. So we need to see what's the policy of the company. But if the com if the investment property is measured at fair value, I'm assuming that you're saying the fair value of the property decreased relative to what the cost of the property is, and as a result, we're making a loss of 500, so that is what I'm reading, um, but we will confirm um, when I read the, when we, when we read the additional information. Does that answer your question? Yes, noted, thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? No other questions, okay. So let's read, move on. Okay, so remember, um, we want to um, make sure you can pick up, we know what the, what the current financial year is, so make sure you pick up everything that impacts the current year, okay? And uh, don't, but don't obviously ignore everything else, but make sure, so obviously um, the current year is generally the most important year. So, so they say, um, so the SG issued debentures to raise finance for various investments, which they wanted to venture into. So on 2nd January, SG issued debentures to Preston Emerson um, on the following terms. So remember, we know debentures is financial instruments. So when we have a financial instrument, we need to identify whether we on the asset side or whether we on the equity or liability side, right? Now remember, when you are the investor, when you are the holder of the investment, you are on the asset side. If you are the issuer, then you are on the liability and equity side. So here we are issuing it. So for us, this is a financial liability. Okay, so generally the bench is gonna be a financial liability. Um, and we, as for Preston, because Preston is the holder, they are investing into this, um, into the debentures, they will have the financial asset. So we're looking at from SG's point of view. So for us, it is a debenture. It also makes sense. I mean, it, it, it is a financial liability. It also makes sense that it is a financial liability to them. I mean, to us, because we are the ones raising the finance. So remember, finance is either equity or liabilities. So, so that from a financial management point of view, it makes sense that um, it is a it is a liability because we are raising finance. Okay. So what do we? So we issue debentures to the um, so debentures to be issued at fair value and will mature on thirty one December twenty twenty four. So yeah, you can see it is. Um, how many years is this now? 2020, 20, five years. So 2020, 2021, 22, 23, 24. So it's a five year debenture period. Okay. The number of debentures, 200,000, to be redeemed at a premium of 4% um, of par. Okay. So we'll have to find out what is par value. Nominal value for each debenture is $18. So here we go nominal value, par value, same thing. Nominal value, par value, face value, it's the same thing. So 18 Rand is face value. The redemption amount is 4% above the face value. Coupon payment shall be 9% per annum. Okay. Market interest for similar instruments is 8.5%. Okay. Um, and then transaction costs of uh, is 10,000. Um, transaction cost is $10,000. SG had not designated the debentures in any specific category as per IFRS 9. Okay, so for us, this is going to be a financial liability. A financial liability at acquisition is measured at fair value. And um, so at acquisition, um, the financial liability is measured at fair value. So we're going to say debit bank credit um, liability fair value. Okay, any difference between the bank amount and fair value will either be a gain or a loss. Okay, so just be aware of that. 
So we're going to say debit bank credit um, was we raising finance, so we're making money. So debit bank and credit, um, credit fair value. So we need to work out the fair value. Any difference is going to be a difference. Any difference between fair value and the bank amount will be a day one gain or loss, okay? So that will hit profit or loss. The second thing we have to work out is interest expense in the current year. So remember they issued this on 30th June. I mean, they issued this on 2nd January. The first interest payment is only happening on 31 December, 2020. Our financial year is 30th June, 2020. So although we never made an interest payment, we are incurring an interest expense for the six months. So we will have to work out what is the interest expense for that six months. Okay, so just be aware of that. Um, so there's going to be two aspects over here. Two numbers that's going to hit profit or loss in the 2020 financial year. The interest expense on the debentures for the six months and potentially, which is most likely going to happen, a, ga a gain or a loss on day one. Because remember, when you recognize a financial instrument, whether it's a financial asset or financial liability, the instrument must be recognized at fair value at acquisition. So, and then you must also recognize the bank, the, the cash amount. So we're gonna say debit bank because we're making money. That's easy. The debit bank is simply 200 times, um, Um, the just to be a fair value. Okay, um, I'm assuming okay, we will have to see what is the fair value, but let's just assume this is the fair value. This is not the fair value, but let's just assume it would be debit bank, um, 200 times 18 rand, for example. That's the cash amount, and then we must compare it to the fair value. Okay, so we'll have to have a look whether it's going to be a gain or loss on day one. Okay, so we'll have to work out the fair value. Now we're going to come to um, now we're going to come to um, in investment in Kim. Now, um, okay, we'll come to that just now. So SG purchased six hundred thousand shares in Kim. LTD, a Zimbabwean incorporated entity on 1 July 2019. From this date, SG obtained control of Kim LTD. Now, remember they, they bought this on 1 July 2019. Um, that is the beginning of the current year. Okay, so that is the beginning of the current year. Um, Am I right? Yes, that's the beginning of the current year. From this, okay, so from this date, SG obtained control. So therefore, from 1 July 2019, we need to consolidate because we have control. Remember, 1 July 2019 is, is the beginning of the current financial year. Kim's functional and presentation currency is ZW, um, is Zimbabwe dollars. Kim makes its money through buying and selling or leasing properties in Harare. SG paid 700,000 for the net assets of Kim. The share capital of Kim was $800,000 and the retained or accumulated loss was um, $100,000. At acquisition, all assets and liabilities were fairly valued except land, which had a fair value of 150 and a carrying amount of 50,000. SG had no intention of utilizing assessed losses when it acquired Kim. The profit for the 2020 financial year was 300,000. Due to COVID-19, SG was not able to pay rentals for the head office in Harare and was forced out by the lesser. Management of from SG entered into an arrangement with Kim, whereby SG will move into one of the properties that Kim was selling. The property is located at, um, at M Park and has a fair value of, of $450,000. SG moved into the property on 1 June 2020 and would be operating from there until they constructed new state-of-the-art head office in the same area on a piece of land purchased from Kim. Okay, so what you must understand over here now, so Kim is leasing to, um, to SG. Now in the separate financial statements, in Kim's separate financial statements, Kim um, that, that's an investment property for Kim, 
Why? Because, um, why? Because um, Kim is earning rental income from a property. So it meets the definition of an investment property for Kim's separate books. However, from the group statement of, from the group point of view, that property is can't be investment property. The reason being is Kim, who, who is the lessee? So um, Kim is leasing it out to SG. Now from a group perspective, Kim and SG is one. So therefore, in the, from a group perspective, the property is not investment property. The property is owner occupied and hence it is PPE. Okay, so just be aware of that. The fact that from a group perspective, the, the property is occupied by SG. It makes the property owner occupied. All owner occupied property is PPE. Okay, so let's just be aware of that. So, um, so that 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 will that, um, that will cause a difference. So any so that means any fair value gains or losses that Kim recognized in terms of investment property will have to be reversed, and the group will recognize depreciation um, in terms of the of the PPE um, of the PPE accounting policy. Okay, so just be aware of that. In Kim's separate books, it is investment property. Why? Because Kim is earning, um, Kim is making money through the rental of it. Okay, so that property meets the definition of investment property. However, that very same property from a group perspective does not meet investment property definition because it meets it, it is owner occupied by SG. As a result, because it's owner occupied, it becomes PPE. Okay, and as a result, the accounting treatment from the group perspective needs to be in terms of PPE and not in terms of investment property. Okay, does that make sense? Any questions on that? Any questions on that? Uh, take out nothing. So SG purchased the piece of land for um, for ZWL um, for two hundred thousand, which was at a markup of twenty five percent from Kim on one June twenty twenty. Okay, so there we um, we purchased land. And it's that is now an intercompany sale. So any intercompany unrealized profit needs to be eliminated. Okay, does that make sense? So just be aware of that. The following are the terms of the contract as per Kim LTD, um, who reviewed the accounting for this transaction that was done by Kim's accounting assistant. Okay, so they say lease is for six months. SG will use the head office for the next six months with an option to extend for an additional 12 months, which is more likely as the construction of the new head office will still be underway. Um, will still be underway. Kim LTD is still interested in selling the head office once the lease term with SG has expired. Lease payments shall be six monthly payments um, in arrears. Um, the head office. Um, useful life is 20 years, breach of contract. If any parties breaches the contract, they are, are required to pay 10,000. Interest implicit in the in the contract is 12% per annum before tax. Okay, so there's just a lease agreement between them. So we'll have to have a look at the details of that. Okay, um, additional information. It is the accounting policy of SG to account for investment in subsidies at cost SG elected to measure non-controlling interest at their proportionate share. Profit off the tax and other comprehensive income accrue evenly. Um, assume a normal tax rate of that percentage. Okay. And then SG is not considered a shared trader for income tax purposes. Okay. Um, do you have any questions on, on, on this so far? Let's have a look who's here, um, Jeffrey. I oh, know actually, wait, um, 
Magaya, Desiree, Jeffrey, any questions from your side before we move on? No, I have no questions. Um, Justin, Leonard, Nason. No questions. Thank you. No questions. Uh, first, thank you. Shaila, Taura, Tinashi, Walter. No questions, guys. Thank you. Okay. No questions. Okay, no problem. So now we're going to, um, I'm going to set up the, the statement of trainers in equity. There's actually quite a nice question. So let me just see quickly what is the required. Let's check something quickly. So there's quite a few nice questions. I'm going to set up the, the, the statement of changes in equity. What's the name of this question now? SG. Before I go on to this, can I, I just want to ask you, Clay, um, what does your guys' schedules look like? Are you still doing classes? Is classes done? Um, how does it work? Well, what's happening at the moment? Are you like at home or like studying? Like what is the current situation? So someone can tell me. Justin, maybe you. You're the spokesperson. Oh, okay, guys. Um, so currently, we we are starting from home, uh, but we 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 are having some lessons here and there. I think um, uh, and some tutorials as well during the week, um, one or two. But as 
moment uh, until we get to November. I, I haven't checked the timetable. Maybe somebody here might have checked, but um, I'm not sure if we have any lectures, but we have a mock uh, test this weekend. What? You have? So basically... Yeah, uh, mock, yeah, mock test this weekend. Yes, we have a mock test this weekend oh, oh. Uh, for, all, for, for all the four courses. Oh. But uh, basically, once we got into uh, the last, you know, uh, quarter, I mean, this last month, uh, we went to final. Uh, we went to final exam. Yes, when you're going to the final exam, actually. Um, when, when, uh, when is finals? When when is finals? What date? November. Hey. Eh? Yes, date? it's two November. Oh, second November. Oh, I see. Okay. Now, but what I want to um, what I want to do is I want to give you guys an extra session for this question, but um on condition that you guys work through it before the time so that we have a, so that we actually so what i want you guys to come with is don't have to have the answer you don't have to have the solution it's just the numbers so for example if i just share if we if I just share um i just do this quickly um what do i So for example, you don't have to have the actual solution or the, uh, answer the actual question, right? All I want is, for, like for example, over here, what would, the, what would be the profit or loss impact over here? Over here, what would be the impact of the profit or loss over here? Like, you know, the numbers, just some numbers, the income statement balance sheet. Same thing over here, what would be the impact on certain, like just to work out some numbers so that when I, then I do it with you, then we can go a bit more quicker. And also, if we go a bit more quicker, because you've done it, you would be able to see where I, what I'm doing versus what you are doing, and it'll go much quicker. So from all of your guys, and each of you tell me whether you're able to do it. So if I say, oh, we're gonna continue our schedule as per normal, but to, for this class, for, for another extra session on, on FAC, I run it next week, Friday, not Friday coming, next week, Friday. Um, and then we, 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 we answer, we only answer everything, but I'll select as, aspects of the question so that we can make sure we get all the right numbers. So would you guys have the time to actually work out some of the numbers for this question? Like you can just give me a thumbs up or put in the put in the chat yes or no or whatever, just quickly. Because if you can't, then I'm, there's no point in having the extra class. Uh, anyone can unmute. Uh, yeah, or I'll put it in the chat so I can see. So Magaya, Desire. Um, Jeffrey, Leonard, Nyson, Shayla, Taura, Tinashi, Walter. Okay, so what? Um, I don't know where the other people. This is, a, this is a very good question they gave you over here. Um, so I'm going to still set up, I'm still going to set up the, the statement of change in equity, but I just want you to try to get some, some numbers. Okay, so, you, um, so then when we actually answer the question, we can do it a bit faster and over and above that, you can compare to my answer and then we can see um, where we differ. Okay, so let me just share, um, I'm just gonna share this, where's this? So I'm gonna share, um, so let me just set up income, I'm gonna set up the statement of changes in equity. So what you must understand, what is the statement of changes in equity? 
The statement of change in equity is just basically a reconciliation of the opening and closing balances of all the equity numbers, okay? So just basically a, a reconciliation of the opening and closing equity balances. Now, what is a reconciliation? A reconciliation is simply an explanation of how the opening balance went from the opening balance to the closing balance. So you explaining to the user of financial statements numerically how a, the opening balance moved to its closing balance. Okay, so that is basically what a reconciliation is. You're just explaining a movement so that um, so people can understand what's driving the numbers. So when you set up a statement of change in equity, you're going to have a details column. You don't, you don't actually call it details. I just call it details. You have nothing over there, actually, but I'm just putting details. Then the columns is basically each equity balance. Okay, so your typical equity balances is share capital, is retained earnings. There could be a revaluation surplus. Um, they could be mark to market. And then this is basically parents total. Then we have non-controlling interest and this will be total. Okay, so basically all we're having is um, the balances of the different equity numbers, okay? Now, remember what we're trying to do, we're trying to explain opening balance, trying to reconcile how the opening balance went from the opening balance to the closing balance. So that's what we're trying to get to. Now the question is, what dry, what what are the movements that can happen? So the typical movements would be um, total comprehensive income. Now remember, total comprehensive income is made up of profit or loss, and then the different types of and then other comprehensive income. Okay, OCI. You can write the full terms OCI. So what what changes the balances is profit or loss and OCI. What can also change is an acquisition of a sub. Okay, so you can have an acquisition like we had in this card, acquisition of subsidiary. Now remember, you will have an acquisition of a subsidiary if you acquired a sub in the current financial year. If you acquired a subsidiary in the current financial year, it, will, it only goes under NCI, okay? OCI would go over there and over here, okay? Profit or loss will go under retained earnings. OCI can either be under revaluation surplus and or mark to market reserve. Okay, so you will have profit or loss, other comprehensive income. If you acquired a sub during the current financial year, you will have acquisition of a subsidiary. And then you would have, I mean, there's, there's more other stuff, but you, you don't, we're not dealing with change in ownership. So I'm not going to bring in change in ownerships. Um, then we would have, and there's no foreign subsidiary. So we don't have foreign subs. We don't have change in ownership. So I'm not going to bring in those line items. Then lastly, we would have dividends. Okay. The dividends will go under retain earnings. The dividends over here, the dividends over here is only the dividends of the parent. So in our question, it will only be the dividends of SG. It won't be the dividends of, of MS, nor the dividends of Kim. Over here, this will be the NCI's portion of dividends from Kim and from MS. Okay, because MS and Kim are both subsidiaries. So they both have, a, have an NCI component. So the dividends over there would only be the NCI's portion of the subsidiaries. Okay, this dividend over here is only the dividends of the parent company, which is SG. So it's very, very important. When you get the profit or loss number, what you must know 
that everything over here before is only the parent's portion. Okay, so everything over here is only the parent's portion. NCI's portion is sitting in this column over here. So you don't bring in 100% over here. You only bring in the parent's portion. Very, very important to understand. So this section over here is the parent's portion of the tax. Okay, so please be aware of that. So when we bring in profit over here, it is not the 100% profit from the statement of, of profit or loss, but rather the parent's portion of profit. Over here, that is the NCI's portion of profit. Similarly, it is the parent's portion of OCI and then the NCI's portion of OCI. So just be aware of that. This year is NCI at acquisition, okay? So if you acquired a subsidiary during the current financial year and there is a goodwill, I mean, I'm sorry, my mistake. If, they, if you acquire a subsidiary during the current year, the NCI's portion at acquisition will go over here. Okay, so just be aware of that. So that is just basically the setup. Um, so what I'm gonna ask you to try to get the numbers as far as possible, try to work out. So what you must try to work out is the following. Try to work out profit from um, profit okay, for SG. Try to work out profit for MS and then try to work out the profit for what's other one? Kim. If basically just do this for me, actually, just simple. Work out the profit for SG from a group perspective. Work out the profit um, for MS from a group perspective and work out the profit from Kim from a group perspective. So try to have that for the next lesson. When we do this, we do this, not, not Friday coming, next week, Friday. Okay, so it gives you time to try to get the numbers. What we will continue going um, is the normal schedule. So we're gonna start off. So the normal schedule ends today for FAR. On Thursday, we resume with MAC. We will start with the first class of MAC. But we're gonna finish this question as an extra lesson next week, Friday. Um, so just try to get me the profit numbers, okay? If you can get me the profit numbers, that's gonna make life a lot easier when I work through it. So we can go at a, at a faster pace and then you can also see the difference in how you got to a number and how I got to a number. Remember, we can get to the same answer, but in a different way, that's totally fine. Or we got different numbers. We can figure out why we got different numbers. Or you, uh, we, we included different things and we can understand why we included different things. You will learn so, so much more. Okay, so are we happy? Are we good with that? Yes, yes, we're good. And I think that's okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so there's no other questions. Is there any other questions from your guys' side before we end today, tonight's lesson? Not from my side, but it's Okay. Uh, don't we have something on YouTube already so that we can maybe go through it in relation to the statement of changes in English? Um, definitely. I just don't know which question now. Um, I'll, I'll check. I just don't know which question. I, th I think it's... I think I did one with um, now recently with the CTA guys in the exam prep. I'm going to just check, then I'll share it with you. Okay, just remind me on Friday. Okay, thank you. Okay, there's no questions. We guys good to go. Any other questions? Okay, uh, maybe my question is, I understand, confirm we're about to finish the lecture now. Yes. 
Okay, my question is maybe we just need a brief summary of how we go about consolidations, the processes that we probably need to consider as we go through our, um, our consolidation process um, up until we finish so that at least we do not have to skip any process along the way. I understand questions will come in different ways, maybe where you can jump a certain process because of the required, but what exactly do we have to go through so that we don't leave out certain concepts that are needed during consolidation? Okay, um, I get what you're saying. Um, so that is a long, process so um how do I yeah so so like by the study was you just wanted to work through question papers because you're happy with um the theory what I can do was uh, was basically going through the process itself is probably a completely separate lesson on its own what I can do just think quickly what i can do is is send you a few videos one we are just basically explain the the theory and the process of consolidation without any question um then the second video well once again i'm gonna have to look through it first um is one of the um probably in the first for test one or test two for for the cta guys then we do a full consolidation question and then through that we all i also explain how we go through but using an actual question so the first one is basically working through the, the thinking process of consolidations without doing a question we just go through it from a a a, a general point of view on how to think about consolidations. So I can share that video. Then I can share another video where we actually do a question applying the principles. But obviously, applying the principles is not going to be every possible scenario because it's only answering that particular question. Would that be useful for you? Who asked that question? Let me know that if that will be useful. Yes, um, I think it will be useful as long as you are satisfied that the contents of the video will address everything to do with consolidation. I think I'll be okay with that. When you say everything, I, I never cover everything. So I don't want to say yes, but I never cover everything. All the fundamentals, yes, but every possible thing, no. So um, fundamentally, yes. Okay, um, by everything, I just mean generally something that can help us have a better understanding as we get into the exam. Yeah, yeah, so that will definitely do that. But, but not every possible scenario, okay. All right. Okay, so I'll share that. And what's the other one? There so was a consolidation. And then the other one was, what did the other person ask me again for? Um, I think who asked me now? Wasn't there another one that um, someone asked me now for another question? Was it you, Nice, and asked me for this now? Was, were you the only one now? Um, for me, you've already answered my question. Same. It's just one. Okay, cool. So I will just remind me by Friday, okay? That's okay, thank you. Okay. Um, any other questions? And then if you're struggling, please like ask me. Eh? You can ask me in the group. I may not answer you immediately, but um, that also helps me to identify where areas of struggling and, um, and common areas. Because then I, um, usually what I do, if there's a common area, um, then I would send a video out or like a voice note or a video, or just write up something. Um, so don't, you can ask me, don't just wait for the class. You can ask me in the group, 
I may not answer immediately, like I said, but um, I will get to it. Okay. So if, you, so if you work through other questions and you're struggling, please feel, feel, feel free to message me and then I can help with that. Um, yeah, you just use the group. Just use the, the group, should be fine. Okay. So any other questions? There's another questions we guys good to go. Well, thanks guys, not for me. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.